Hello and welcome to A Time to Reconcile. I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Thank you for joining with my wife and I here today as we record this sermon message. The sermon message title is Knowing the Times and the Seasons. And this does tie into my sermon last week, but it's more on the prophetic than the other sermon was. So one of the most important aspects of our lives is to have a good understanding of the times and the seasons of life. Because when we do, we can enjoy the life we have in the season we are now living. These times and seasons then make more sense as to our purpose for living in the first place. And being an older man, I can certainly say amen to that. There is a time and a season for every aspect of life. Before we get into the scriptures today, I'd like to open with prayer. Please join with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask and pray your blessing and your inspiration with this sermon message about the times and the seasons of life and also in the world events. We ask and pray your blessing, inspiration to be both with me as the one giving, my wife who's re recording the message, and everyone who listens to the message from your word can receive it from you. We thank you and we ask this now in Jesus' holy name. And all together we say, Amen. Let us begin with Ecclesiastes 3. We read this scripture last week, but it certainly ties into this message as well. Ecclesiastes 3, beginning in verse 1. There is a time for everything. And the more years that go by in a person's life, the more a person realizes this in the natural even, let alone the spiritual. And a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And doesn't that describe a lifetime of times, of times and seasons? So the beginning of the New Testament church was a time and a season. Let's notice that over in Acts, the first chapter. Acts, the first chapter. And we want to begin in verse 4, Acts 1 and verse 4. On one occasion, it begins. While he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. And of course, he was talking about the receiving of the Holy Spirit. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In other words, like with water overcoming the body and water baptism, so when we receive the Holy Spirit, it overcomes the body completely and settles in our heart. It's a baptism of the Spirit. That's a real thing. It happens. A lot of people experience it in all manner of different ways, but it happens in that manner. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And that was the thing they were interested in. No, it wasn't that season and it wasn't that time. In fact, that won't happen until the very end. And that's why the devil wants to have 
it in sooner than that. <laughs> and that's why the, all the unrest has been with Israel down through its history. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates. The Father has said by his own authority. So who, who sets the times and the seasons for us? Our Heavenly Father. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now they didn't even know where the ends of the earth were then. But what are we to do? We are to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now what is our witness? Well, we've been baptized in the Spirit. Jesus now lives in our heart. What is our witness? Well, what is that going, what's going on there? What's happening in the life that we have with Jesus? Anything? Well, if nothing's happening, we can't witness, can we? But that's not Jesus' fault. It would be our fault for not responding to the fact He lives in our heart. What are we going to do? Just ignore Him? Well, of course we don't want to do that, but then if we end up doing that, that's a problem. And we have to deal with that being a problem. And after He said this, He was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid Him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as, as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, angels. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So when he comes back for the second time, it'll be in glory like he went up to the right hand of the Father in glory. So that's an end goal. We look forward to His second coming. So what are we doing in the meantime? What's in between time? What are the signs of His glorious second coming? See, in 70 AD when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, the disciples thought since Rome destroyed the temple that that was the end time. And it was not, because that wasn't to all the world yet. It was only to the Roman Empire that the witnessing, witnessing had gone on. So there was more to do in that regard. So let's now go to Daniel the seventh chapter. Daniel the seventh chapter. Daniel seven and verse twelve. Actually, let us begin in verse 15. Daniel 7, verse 15. I, Daniel, was troubled in the spirit, and my visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all of this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth, but the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. And that is at the end of the age. Yes, forever and ever. That's when Jesus returns in glory. That's when that will happen. Then I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying with its iron teeth and bronze claws. The beast had crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on his head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell, the horn that looked more imposing than the others. So you see the things that are beginning to look more ominous are the, are the horns that Daniel saw. World powers have always been trying to destroy the enemy's land and history. Uh, that's always been in what's happening in the world. But there's a sinister plan that's going on where Satan is going to have the false prophets stand up and declare that he is God rather than Jesus being God and deceive many. 
So the horn that looked more imposing than the others and had eyes and a mouth and spoke boastfully. And as I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. So we have to endure to the end. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a, beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kings and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. And that has been likened to the Roman Empire. The ten horns and ten kings who will come from this kingdom after them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change set times and the laws. So try to change the times and seasons. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times and a half a time, three and a half years. But the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. And of course, then it was written down so we could read it today and see why he would have turned pale. He had good reason to. So there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. See, when Jesus was born, the three magi saw the star of David in the heavens. And they knew that the Son of God was being born in Bethlehem. So they're the only ones who responded to it. The people of Judah didn't respond to it. They watched the heavens too, but they didn't respond to it. Will we respond to the signs in heaven that God puts there for us to respond to? Well, I hope we will. But we've got to watch. We've got to be engaged to do that. So let's go to Luke, the 21st chapter now. Luke 21, beginning in verse 25. Luke 21 and verse 25. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. See right there. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity in the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming in the world. And we're beginning to feel some of that apprehension now, aren't we? Over in the Middle East. For the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Well, I guess that hasn't happened yet, but it, it will. At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory, so that apparently is closer to Jesus returning. When these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because the redemption is drawing near. You get the sense that Jesus is coming soon, soon. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Notice and watch for the signs and the seasons. The times and the seasons. It's springtime. The fig tree is producing fruit. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This word, the Bible, will never pass away. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life, and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. So we've got to watch, be busy ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ 
and pray and pray. We have to do all those things. And we need to do them together in the body of Christ. Therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Matthew 24, verse 36. Matthew 24, verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Isn't it nice to be the Father's children today? And in Jesus we are, the children of our Father today. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to that day, Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. But he'd been preaching for 120 years, <laughs> so that didn't do any good. But he needed to do that, he and his family. So that was what they did. They did what they needed to do, whether anybody responded to it or not. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. I have a feeling that people are going to respond to the preaching about the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ today. So let us not be wondering if it's going to be effective or not. Let's just do it. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two, men, two women will be grinding with a, a hand mill and one will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day you, your Lord, will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have left his house be broken into. And you know that's what we would do if we knew ahead of time. And now we're being warned ahead of time. So you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. So don't let your guard down. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the Master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? Now food could be spiritual food that we could give to them as well as physical food. It will be good for that servant whose Master finds him doing when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and say, says to himself, My master staying away a long time, and he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. That's inappropriate behavior. Then the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and in an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we have a responsibility as stewards of the gospel message. We have a ministry to do called the Ministry of Christ Reconciliation. And we need to be doing that today. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 5. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know well, very well, that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So it's going to be with all kinds of fireworks and also be like the thief in the night. That's an interesting combination of events, is it not? So while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are the children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. And there, that is some very good advice the Apostle Paul gave to the Thessalonians. 1 Peter 4. 1 
First Peter four verse seven. The end of all things is near. You get that sense, don't you? I get that sense. Therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. What is our best thing to do? It even says this in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, that we should pray all manner of prayers for everything that concerns us. That is Paul's closing recommendation for fighting the good fight. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And that's the big part. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do as one who speaks the very words of God. Here's the Bible to do that. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Jesus is our hope and He's our answer. He's our King of kings and Lord of lords and He wins. And we're going to be with Him. And our Father gathers His children, us, to be the bride of Jesus in the New Jerusalem. You can't get any better than that. But in the meantime, we have these things to watch for and to pray about and be aware of and, and respond to. We have to be the ministers of Christ's reconciliation. That's what He's called us to do. The end, though, is near, very near. We were able to destroy all of life off of this planet now, today, with nuclear bombs held by many countries today who have dictators as their leaders. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. 2 Corinthians 5. Let's start at verse 16. Because we believe in Jesus, because we know that He died and paid for our sins, and He rose from the dead to give us His Spirit life through the Holy Spirit, we know now that we should not regard anyone from a worldly point of view. This is not the time for any of that to go on. We are to be totally of spiritual mindedness as Paul encourages us to do. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. We stop that. Now, we're going to be talking more about God's love and God's love He's given to us and how we're sharing it with other people. We have godly responses to things, not human, carnal responses. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and those who believe in Jesus are, the new creation has come. It's already here. We don't have to wait till Jesus comes in glory. We believe now. We've received the Spirit of Jesus now, the Holy Spirit. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, our Father, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's what we have. That's the commission we've been given as the body of Christ. That is where we are today. He's committed to us the message of reconciliation. Who? God our Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. They all as one have committed the message to us. Just like He did in Acts 1 with the 12, the 11, and then Matthias who became the 12th apostle in Acts 1. Just like then, now is that type of situation. And we need to be busy doing that together. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. 
For God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that's who we are, God's holy children today. So we are the ministers of Christ's reconciliation. We are the ambassadors of his kingdom of light. And the message is, be reconciled to God. What do we need the most in the world? We need to be reconciled to God. What do we need to say to people? Can't think of anything else to say. Let's be reconciled to God. If they're disturbed and upset and bothered, well, how can we help them be at peace? Well, be reconciled to God. God has made you his child in Jesus Christ. Be happy, be glad, and be reconciled to him in relationship. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus. We ask and pray for your complete and total guidance. We live in troublesome, perilous times. And if we just look at those things, it scares us half to death, if not to death. And we realize we need an answer. And you've given us an answer through the prophets, Daniel in particular. And of course, Matthew and, and Luke in the Gospels, Paul and Peter in the Epistles, and others. You've given us this wealth of information in your Holy Word to give us an understanding of how we need to behave. So please help us to do that and to be your ministers of your reconciliation, Jesus, and the ambassadors of your kingdom of light. We thank you so much. We ask and pray your blessing to be upon us. Please protect us from Satan and his demons this coming week. We ask and pray now your blessing. In Jesus' most holy and righteous name, and all together we say, Amen.